All right, so I'm going to be continuing the series that I've kind of been starting with about taking heed. Remember I started about two weeks ago, just taking heed. First week, taking heed to basically just a God's commandments overall, pretty general, just making sure we're taking heed to the law of the Lord that's still important for us today in the New Testament. And then last week, I went over idolatry. That was, a, that was the big, that's like probably the number one thing that's mentioned in the Bible in reference to like take heed and beware using those words is, is found more often about adultery. And tonight, what I'll be preaching on is taking heed to covetousness. Uh, the Bible says, you know, and of course, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 10, which is where we've been getting the text verse from for this whole series, you know, wherefore let him that thinketh he stand to take heed lest he fall. We all want to take heed, and we're trying to take heed to the things that the Bible says to take heed to, right? We don't want to fall. We don't want to get into these problems and any of these, you know, sin, sinful actions or whatever that we want to get the warnings from the Bible. We want to beware and make sure we don't fall into these traps. So, um, I'm going to start off, keep your finger there, keep a bookmark there. We're going to go back to Luke, but turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 6. First of all, God abhors, the Bible uses the word abhor, it's another word for hate. It's a very strong word to use. Um, God abhors the covetous. In Psalm 10, verse number 3, the Bible says, For the wicked boasteth of his heart's desire, and blesseth the covetous whom the Lord abhorreth. See, the wicked person, they, they're proud, they boast of their heart's desire, and then they bless those that are also wicked, blessed those that are covetous. And the Bible says that the Lord hates those that are, that are covetous. So right off the bat, we could see, you know, I mean, this is, this is something that we want to stay far from. Not only that, if you're a covetous person, the Bible says that you are a wicked person. You know, keep your book. Uh, we're going to go to 1 Timothy 6. I just want you to see this. You've probably seen this before. 1 Corinthians chapter 5. I know you're keeping multiple bookmarks. I promise this is the most bookmarks you'll have in one place tonight in the sermon. We're going to go to 1 Timothy 6 right after this. 1 Corinthians 5. I just want you to see this. 1 Corinthians 5 gives us a list of sins that people can commit if you're considered a brother that is going to get you thrown out of this church and thrown out of any Bible-believing church that's going to use the Bible as the standard on how things ought to be run within the church. And not only kicked out of church, but you ought to not be fellowshipping outside of church with people that are guilty of these sins that we see in 1 Corinthians chapter number 5 because the Bible says that they're wicked people. Yes, you could be saved and still be a wicked person. Look at um, verse number 11. He starts off the list in 1 Corinthians 5. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. So keeping company goes beyond just attending church together. But the reason why people get kicked out of church is because if you're not supposed to keep company, well, when people are congregated together, we're fellowshipping here at church, that's keeping company. They're not going to be part of our company. But they're also not going to be part of your company. They ought not to be at least. After someone is thrown out, at least until they repent. When they repent, they get right with God, great. We're going to put all that stuff behind. Come back, brother. You know, but until that time, anybody guilty of these specific sins in this list is not going to be welcome here and not going to be welcome, hopefully, in your company either. But I have now written unto you not to keep company. If any man is called a brother, be a fornicator, look at the second one, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one, no, not to eat it. Don't even go have a meal with this person. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. This is the way that the Bible portrays a believer that's covetous. Covetousness is a, is a very serious sin. Now, I just want to get this out of the way right now because uh, I have this a little bit out of order in my notes, but it's fine. I, I want to make sure we all understand what covetousness even is. It's not that difficult to understand, but, you know, I, I think everyone here does, but I, I, we need to just, I just need to be thorough and make sure that there's no misunderstanding about what covetousness even means and what it is. Because it's not a word that's used very often today. Right? It's, not, it's not 
Uh, unless, unless you got people who really read their Bible a lot, covetousness isn't really something that's talked about very often out in the world. You don't hear that word used very much because the world doesn't want you to even think about covetousness. They want you being covetous without knowing that you're being covetous. So basically anything that you want that you either can't have or shouldn't have is being covetous. Now, at some level, everyone will be guilty of this, you know, to some degree. But being a covetous person kind of identifies a lot about you. That's not just a slip up in one thing with one, you know what I mean? Like, like we don't just say, oh, you wanted something you shouldn't have wanted, so now you're just completely kicked out of the church. No, a covetous person is someone who's always looking at, you know, that's consuming them, kind of eating them up, and, and that's what they're after, that's what they're about, is things. So that can be things like something that's sinful, because it's something you shouldn't have, right? Um, booze, for example, right? Someone wants to, to get drunk, and you're covetous, you're longing after this. That's, that, you're, you're coveting something. The Bible says not to have it, not even to look upon it, but if you are, are just kind of yearning for, you're desiring it, you're coveting something that you shouldn't have or coveting another person's spouse, a, a husband or a wife or just some other person. You know, you're married and, and you're, you're wanting to have this person or that person. You can't have that according to the Bible. That's not something you should do. That's sinful. And that is being covetous. Also things that you can't have. So maybe there's something that just costs a whole bunch of money and you don't have the money for it, right? And it's not necessarily anything sinful. It could be a, you know, a sports car or a boat or what, you know, whatever, whatever things that are not inherently sinful that people might want to have. And for different people, it could be all kinds of different things because there's people who don't have very much money at all and people have more money. You know, so it's like if someone has the means to drop a bunch of money on some thing that's just not inherently sinful, that's not, there's nothing wrong with that. They could go ahead and they go out and buy it and, and it's done. No big deal, no sin. But when you are just looking at something and desiring something and wanting something and you don't have the money for it and you're not going to be able to get it, that becomes sinful. That's covetousness. That's desiring something that you can't have. Wishing you had something that, that God hasn't given you the means for. Now, this sermon is going to go really good hand-in-hand -hand with this morning's sermon about, um, you know, we read a lot of uh, verses about being content, right? We're talking about being thankful. Thankful with what you have goes along with being content with what you have. And when you're content with what you have, you're not going to be looking at other things that you don't have and be worried about being covetous toward that. A covetous heart is actually a very selfish heart and can become a bitter heart. Why? Because you don't have something, you become bitter over not having whatever it is you're setting your focus on. And again, whether it be another person, whether it be a thing, an object, doesn't matter. There's a, there's a broad spectrum of things that, that covetousness encompasses. Um, Exodus chapter 20 gives a list of a bunch of things. So Exodus 20 is a part of the Ten Commandments, right? The last commandment is, thou shalt not covet. And what it says in verse uh, 17 of Exodus 20 says, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. Saying so something that belongs to somebody else and it's not yours. It goes well beyond just a, you know, a, a, a spot, right? A, a, this, this lustly desire of just wanting maybe another person. It's, it's anything that belongs to them. You know, some people look at other people. And honestly, they, they kind of wish they had that person's life. Maybe they feel miserable where they're at. They're not content with the things that they have. And they look at someone else, oh man, this person's got it all together. I just wish I had their life. I wish my husband was like their husband. I wish my wife was like their wife. I wish I had all the things that they have. I wish I lived in a house like they do. I wish I had a car like they have. I wish I had kids like they have. I wish that was my life. That's covetousness and that's wicked. That is a wicked to watch out for that trap too. Of, of, you know, take heed, beware, look out for covetousness, wanting these things that you ought not to have, that you, that you can't have. That is one of the Ten Commandments. It's a very serious sin. 
So the, the, the covetous heart is a selfish heart because you're thinking about yourself. You're thinking about what you want and what you need to have. And, and it becomes bitter because you don't have those things. And it's miserable to be covetous because a covetous person's never going to be satisfied. You're never going to have enough. The thing that you think you want to have, you know, the Bible, or not the Bible, the Bible doesn't say this, but just, just uh, the world says this, everyone says this, and it's true. You know, the, 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 the grass is greener on the other side of the fence, right? Always, things always look better, more from a distance. What other people have, oh man, that always looks better. And then you get in the situation or you actually get in like, oh, it actually wasn't as good as I thought it was. People have a tendency to build things up and they, they're, not, they're not nearly as cool as you think. You know, people want the newest phones. After like a week or two, it's just kind of like, you know, it's just a phone, right? Newest gadgets, the newest cars, the newest whatever, you know, it gets, be why? Because marketers will build it all. Oh, you need to have this and everyone's talking about it. And oh man, you, you, need, to, you need to spend $1,000 on this phone, you know, to talk to somebody because it's got a camera and I don't know. I mean, I, I, I have, you know, one of those fancy phones over there. I don't even know what it does. I don't even care what it does. I just wanted the stupid thing to work and it didn't even fix my problem. <laughs> I'm ready to go back to a flip phone just to get, a, just to get a, a phone where I can talk to people because that's like what I use it for. Anyway, I'm getting off on a tangent there. Covetousness. We, don't, we, we, we need to, instead of looking at the things that you have and being thankful, you know, the covetous heart or the covetous person is going to focus on what you don't have and that makes you unhappy. As I was talking about this morning, you know, when you're, when you're thankful and content with what you have, you're going to be, you're going to have joy. You're going to have peace. Everything's going to be just fine. Why? Because you're not going to be stressed out and worried about all these things you don't have. Who cares? You don't have it. Get over it. Right? Be happy for what you do have. The covetous person is never happy. They're never satisfied. Even these people, I mean, that's why you see wicked, you know, movie stars, you know, uh, rock stars, whatever, they have all of this money, but none of that makes them happy. They're not content. That's why they're, they're, they're going through getting divorces and remarriages and going on drugs and dying early and, you know, and living this lifestyle and they're miserable. Why? Because they have so much and they just want more or whatever. You know, they, they, they're not finding happiness. They're not finding peace because they're not just willing to be content. I mean, Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy 6. That's where we want you to go back. I just want you to see how, how serious this is because covetousness can destroy your life. Now that we've kind of established what covetousness is, what, what does it mean to be covetous? You're looking at something and desiring something that you can't or shouldn't have. That's covetousness. And that's a heart problem. It's not even necessary. No, someone might not even know that you're covetous. Just, I mean... There could be people here that are covetous and I would never even know, necessarily, right? Until you start talking to someone a lot more or whatever and things just start coming out because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. But it's something that really you have to deal with in your heart. Because you're not necessarily going off and breaking a commandment. Right? You could be covetous after someone, someone else's spouse and not actually go through and commit the act of committing adultery. But the covetousness itself is a wicked sin. Wanting that, desiring that, something you can't have, that, is, that alone is an extremely wicked sin. You don't even have to go off and commit the action in order to be guilty of that sin. But see, it's something that it's in your heart, it's in your mind, no one else can, would necessarily know that. So, you know, everyone needs to do a self-analysis on your own covetousness and beware of it, take heed why? Because it will destroy your life. Covetous will destroy your life. 1 Timothy chapter 6, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, But godliness with contentment is great gain. Again, referring to being content with what you have. If you're godly, if you're, do, you're living a godly life and you have contentment about that, that's great gain. For we brought nothing into this world and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. This is our instruction on what we need to be content with. Food and clothing. Do you have those two things? I know everybody in this room does. I know like everybody in America does. Food and clothing. And the Bible says we ought to be content with that. 
We don't need to be complaining and coveting and wanting all this other stuff and wanting all, you know, the whole world, Obama or Trump or whoever is in president, they, they need to give me a bunch of free stuff. I'm entitled to all this stuff. No, you're not. The Bible says be content. Hey, do you have clothing? Do you have, do you have clothes on your back? Yes. Do you have food? Well, I don't have a steak. The Bible doesn't say you're going to get a steak. Okay, it just says food and clothing. Be content. Be satisfied with what you have. It's, it'll do wonders for your life. You'll be happy. And, it's, and, then, and then it follows up that admonition, having food and raiment, let us be there with content. Let's just, work, you know, we got that, we're doing good. Having that type of an attitude. But they that will be rich. Now, it doesn't mean they are, that are going to be rich, like something's going to happen, they're going to be rich. Will means it's what you want. It's your desire. They that will be which, which, rich, they that will be rich. If you have this goal and this desire in your mind, I want to be rich. I want to have lots of riches. If that's where your heart is, if that's where your mind is, the Bible says they that will be rich fall. It doesn't say they might fall. It doesn't say this might happen to you. It says, no, they fall. They that will be rich fall into temptation and a snare. When your desire is to have a bunch of this world's riches, you will fall into temptation. You're going to fall into a snare. A snare is a trap. And into many foolish and hurtful lusts, which drown men in destruction and perdition. It will destroy your life. You're going to be drowned in these lusts and in these sinful acts and things that hurt other people and yourself. Because you're, you're focused on the wrong thing. You're focused on the, this world's riches. For the love of money is the root of all evil. And praise God for the King James Bible. Praise God for his word that he's preserved for us today. Because it's not a root of many types of evil, like these modern versions will say. No, it is the root. Again, another reason, take heed. Loving money, wanting things, wanting money, that is the root of all evil. Evil is doing harm to other people. The root of all of that, the source, is loving money. Which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. What happens? People are erred from the faith. You can be saved and be covetous. Don't trick yourself and think you can't be. Don't, don't, don't let these people deceive you into thinking that, oh, a saved person would never do that. And, really? Then why in 1 Corinthians 5 did he say to put away from among yourselves that wicked person if anyone's called a brother? A brother is someone who's saved. Becomes covetous. Or here it says, why does they say they've erred from the faith? Yeah, you put your faith in Jesus Christ. He, he saved your soul but now you've got this desire and lust for money and covetousness, it's going to drown you. It's going to hurt you. It's your, your, your life is going to be destroyed. Go back, if you would, to Luke chapter 12. You can start losing those bookmarks now. We're, we're going back to Luke chapter 12. We need to be aware of covetousness, especially at this time of year in America, more than ever. I mean, it's, 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 a, it's a daily thing where we are bombarded with advertising, with marketing, with people trying to get your attention, with trying to get you focused on things that you just need to have. I was talking before, you know, the cell phones or whatever, computers, gadgets, all of these cool things that people want to have is just being, literally, I mean, it's just being crammed on your throat. The more you, you are exposed to the internet, to TV, to, to anything on the right, I mean, it's, it's constant. It's, it's just all over the place. People are trying to sell you stuff and trying to explain to you why you need whatever it is that they're selling. And we need to be aware of this so that you don't fall into that trap of coveting things that either you shouldn't have or you can't have because it's outside of your budget or because it's something that's, that's sinful, something that's not going to be pleasing in God's eyes. Don't fall into the trap of desiring these things. They're going to lead you astray. Luke chapter 12, look at verse number 15. Luke 
Luke chapter 12, verse 15. The Bible says, And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness. This is what we're looking at tonight. We're trying to take heed and beware of covetousness. Why? For a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesses. That's a powerful verse. Your life, what you are, what you're all about, who you are, it has nothing to do with the things that you own. Don't make it about that. You know why? Because that's vain and empty. A lot of people live like life this way. They live life for their status. They live life to accumulate toys and things and cars and houses and whatever money can buy. And they compare themselves and consider themselves successful if you can buy a lot of stuff, if you have this big house, if you, you know, all these things you could accumulate. And Jesus Christ said, beware of that. Don't fall into that trap of that type of a mindset because that's not what your life is all about. God has placed you here for a reason and it wasn't just to accumulate a bunch of crap that's going to be burned up when Jesus Christ comes back anyways. And most of this stuff won't even last that long. Most of the stuff you have, it's fallen apart already. I mean, it falls apart. You know, most of this crap is made in China. It's going to be destroyed in five years, let alone a hundred or however long it's going to take before, you know, doesn't matter. This stuff's going to be gone. Gone. And, and that's going to be, and, and we have a parable in here. We're going to see that. How, um, I believe it's in Luke 16. The man that, that, Laid everything up for himself. He laid up his treasure on this earth and then he died. And it, what good did that do him? That is not what life's all about. If you think that's what life's all about, I, I feel sorry for you. I, really, I feel sorry for people who think that this life is all just about making money and buying things. Because that's miserable. That is truly miserable. Things never make you happy. No matter how much money you have, money does not make you happy. You say, oh yeah, that's why it's easy for you to say, I don't have any money. So, you know, no. Go ahead. Go, go ahead and find out the hard way or you could just believe God's word. You could believe Jesus Christ when he said a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possess. Verse number 16, and he spake a parable unto them saying, the ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruit. So this guy is blessed. His ground, his, 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 his land is just producing. And he's producing all kinds of goods. God's blessed him financially. So now he's thinking, Man, what am I going to do with all this stuff? I don't even have room. I, don't even, I, I have so much being, you know, coming at me. I don't even know what to do with it all. I don't have anywhere to put it. Verse 18, he says, and he said, uh, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater. I'm going to build bigger barns. I've got all this storehouse, which is totally sufficient for me, but I'm getting so much. You know what? I'm going to build even greater. I'm going to store it all up. He said, there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And you know what? What's he focused on here? Himself. Is he, is he thinking, wow, I have way more than I could ever need. Maybe I can help somebody else out. Maybe I can do something for someone. Was that his mindset? No. It was, hey, I know what I'm going to do. I'll just, I mean, I'll just get the biggest barn you've ever seen. And I'm just going to store it up all there. And then verse 19 says, And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. Eat, drink, and be merry. Just go, I'm going to build all this stuff up. I'm going to store it all here. And then I'm going to, oh man, I'm going to be an easy street. I'm going to retire. It's going to be great. I'm just going to eat, drink, be merry, have a party, have fun. But look at what God says to a person like that. that that's, that's where their mind is. That's what they're thinking about. This is what their focus is. But God said unto him, thou fool. Thou fool. You know what's funny? This is the mentality of the majority of people in this country. And I would say probably in the world. I'm going to earn as much as I can. I'm going to store up all this stuff and I'm going to just work and work and work and I'm going to put all this stuff up and then, man, I'm on easy street and I'm going to retire and everything's going to be great. God said, thou fool. 
You've worked so hard and cared so much about the things of this world. Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then whose th who shall those things be which thou hast provided? So you're going to die. You're not even going to get one chance to enjoy any of that stuff. And where's it going to go? Who's going to get it? What does it matter? Who knows who's going to go to? Who knows who? I mean, you're not going to be here anymore. Verse 21, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself. Look at this, and this is key though too, and is not rich toward God. God can bless you with things. I'm not saying that there's anything wrong with being prepared in case you lose your job. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having some money or something kind of put away to help you out when you go through a hard time. But this person, he laid up treasure for himself and he was not rich towards God. He wasn't doing anything for God because he was just focused on this worldly good, the world's goods and, and, and accumulating riches for himself. And honestly, that ought not to be, you know, if God happens to bless anyone here, just, just happen, hey, you know, you're, all of a sudden you're coming into more money and things are getting a little bit easier for you, great, praise God for that. But don't let that then distract you and make you become unfruitful and start getting caught up in all that stuff. Oh man, this is great, I have all this money, you know, and, then, and then it just takes you off instead of saying, no, I'm going to keep serving God. Great, this is nice. Okay, I'll put that over there. But that's not where my heart is. That's not where, you know, I'm not, I'm not laying up this treasure and I'm focused on this treasure. I'm, I'm you know, God bless me. Great. I'm going to use it and it's going to be gone. Whatever. Use it to, to the glory of God. Verse 22, and he said unto his disciples, therefore I say unto you, they're saying because of this story, this man laid up all the treasures and, 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 you know, his soul was required of him. Where'd the stuff go? Now he's going to teach his disciples. He said, Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life what ye shall eat, neither for the body what ye shall put on. What were the two things we're supposed to be content with? Having food and raiment. And what did he even, what did he say? Those are the things that we need. I mean, those things, if we don't have those things, we're not going to live, right? We're not going to survive as a human being on this planet. You need, you need clothing to protect your body from, from the elements, right? And you need food to sustain yourself and to keep going. Pretty simple, pretty basic. But Jesus said to his disciples, says, don't even take thought for those things. Don't even worry about that. What you're going to eat, what you're going to wear. Verse 23, the life is more than meat and the body is more than raiment. Consider the ravens, for they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn. They don't have, he says, they don't go out and plow the fields. They don't put in all this work. They don't store it up. They don't have a place. Okay, now we've got all this stuff. He says, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? We can just look at nature. We can look at birds. We can look at animals. We can see how they survive. We can see that, you know, God provides for all these living creatures. And what he's saying is that, you know, God esteems you better than these animals. So if God's taking care of them, why wouldn't you think that God will take care of you also? And look, I think this is a hard teaching to have this faith that God truly will care about you and that, that you, or, you know, take care for you and that all you need is food and clothing. We have to fight a mindset that tells us we need telephones. We need this. We need that. We need our computer. We need our car. We need this. We need that. We need, 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 need. I, I'm sick of hearing that word need. You know, I try to teach my children, you, know, you don't need that. You don't need it. What you need is food. What you need is clothing. That's what you need. And you already have that. You want things. And be careful with what you want because the Bible says that, you know, they that will be rich, if you're just looking for riches, you're going to fall in the snares. You fall into the trap. Continuing on here, verse 25, it says, And which of you, with taking thought, can add to his stature one cubit? 
If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought for the rest? Consider the lilies, how they grow. They toil not and they spin not. And yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. If then God so clothed the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, how much more will he clothe you, O ye of little faith? And seek not ye what ye shall eat or what ye shall drink, neither be ye of doubtful mind. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. And your Father knoweth that ye have need of these things, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, this is important because God's not saying have faith that God's going to provide for you and just be lazy and don't do anything. Shall we say, people might want to think that, like, oh man, I just have all this faith and I know God is going to provide, I'm just not going to do anything. That's not what God's saying. God has commanded men to work and to provide, but God is ultimately the one who's giving us good gifts. God's the one who provides for you to, to, to do the things you're doing, but he wants you to work for it. He wants you to invest time, but what he really wants more than anything else is for you to seek the kingdom of God first. Please him. Do work for him first. Everything else is secondary. He wants your focus being on serving him, and if you say, well, I can't focus on serving you, God, because I got to make sure that I make enough money to, to do this and do that, that's when you become a fool. Because if you're going to serve me, You'll be taken care of. And I wholeheartedly, if you, if you dedicated your life to just serving God and doing all the things that he said, God will provide for you. Okay, or else these verses aren't true. If you're working for the Lord, God will provide for you. No matter what. And I think the only reason why it's difficult for, and look, I'll be honest with you, it's difficult for me. It's a struggle to try to find the balance between making sure that I'm, that I'm still providing for my family and having the faith to know that God's going to provide for me anyways as long as I'm serving Him. Because I have the desires to, to want to not do my other job at all ever again and just only work for the Lord and do all of that. And maybe, maybe it's a lack of faith on my part. I don't know. It's, um, like I said, this could be a hard... You know, it's a different way of thinking about things. I believe God's words. God will provide for us. The problem, I guess, is when we come into wanting more than what we ought to be content with. And that causes more problems. Look at what he says here in verse 32. He says, Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And I, I think the, the, the point of this too is that he's like, you know, there's a lot of things that you can gain, worldly speaking. Riches, mansions, houses, boats, whatever, all this stuff. Right? All these things. Things that look cool. You could have fun doing. But that is so short-sighted. The Bible stresses, Jesus Christ stresses, especially in the Gospels, of the kingdom to come. We don't know what it all looks like, but we've been told that the things that God has prepared for us is so much greater than we could even imagine. We, we can't even really comprehend how great it's going to be, and it's going to be even better for those who work for God and, and have the faith to say God's a, a just God, God's going to see my work and God will reward me better than I would even think that God's going to reward me by just doing his work and not being focused on I want this thing and that thing and this convenience and that convenience. If we can get those thoughts, and, and it's, I'm not saying this is easy. Again, I'm not saying this is easy, but this is what he's teaching. This is what he's teaching. All the little things that make your life so much easier in this world, God didn't say he put us here to make our lives easy. This short period of time that we exist on this earth while we're breathing breath and we have this, this body here, 
doesn't last very long. We need to be making the most use of our time. And look, God's pleasure is to, is to give us the kingdom. God wants to do that, and he wants to bless us abundantly in that. Verse 33, that's why he says, look, it says, sell that you have and give alms. Get rid of your stuff. Sell your stuff. Hey, give, give all, giving alms is just giving, giving alms to people who are in need. Sell the stuff that you have. What, what are you doing with it? Sell it and just give it to someone who needs it. They need it more than you anyway. Just sell it. Sell your, what do you need the crap for? What do you need the junk for? What do you need your stuff for? Just sell it. Sell it. Give alms. Provide yourselves bags which wax not old, a treasure in the heavens that faileth not, where no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. Anything you own in this world could be stolen from you. Anything, you, and I don't care what type of safe you have or what type of vault you have. I don't care where you're locking it up. It could all be stolen. It's all going to come to nothing. Moth corrupts it, rust corrupts it, whatever. It's going to be gone. No matter how much you try to safeguard it, it can be taken from you. But not your treasure in heaven. Not the vault up in heaven. God's watching over that. No one's going to steal that from you. And you know what? It doesn't get wax old up there either because it's eternal. It lasts forever. The, the rewards that God's going to give you last forever. The Bible says for where your treasure is there, where your heart. But you also remember I said covetousness is a sin of the heart. When we're minded and we're thinking about God's going to reward me if I go soul winning. God's going to reward me if I do this, if I do that. I'm going to get rewards for these things. We need to keep that in our minds because what's going to try to sneak in is say, well, I know I can get rewards for doing this, but if I work extra hours, if I do this, if I do this, I could earn more money and I could have more things and I can make my life just more convenient. The money and the riches can't hold a candle to what God will provide for you. And if you do what God wants you to do and the, and the work that he has for you to do, he says, I'll take, I'll take care of your needs. He didn't say he's going to take care of your wants. He's going to take care of your needs, though. He says, you're going to work for me. I will, make, I will make sure that you have food and that you have clothing. You'll never have to beg for, money, for food. You'll never have to beg. Because God will make sure you're taken care of. But you do have to be working. Be working for him. Covetousness prevents you from earning spiritual rewards. Why? Because it, it distracts you. Turn, if you would, to Luke 16, just a few pages forward in your Bible. Luke 16. You cannot, you cannot serve God if you're a covetous person. It's not going to work. Your focus is going to be on money or on mammon. Luke 16, verse 13, the Bible says, No servant can serve two masters. You have two bosses, either working for one or the other. It says, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Mammon just means money. So you, can't, you can't do both. You need to choose. Do I want to work and just serve money, or do I want to serve God? It's your choice. You can't do both. And the Pharisees also, look at this. Right after he said that you can't serve God and mammon, what do the Pharisees say? And the Pharisees also, who were covetous, Pharisees cared about this thing. You know what? They didn't like hearing that. What do you mean I can't serve God in money? I could, yes, I can. They're covetous. They heard all these things and they derided him. They spoke evil of Jesus Christ because of what he said, because he just said, hey, make up your mind. You can't serve God in money, one or the other. And he said unto them, ye are they which justify yourselves before men, but God knoweth your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is abomination in the sight of God. You know what's highly esteemed among men? Oh, this person's so rich and he's so famous and he's got, you know. You know what God looks at that? He says, that's abomination. God doesn't care for that at all. And they justify themselves before men, but they don't care what God thinks. They're covetous because they're not serving God. They care about serving themselves. They care about getting more money. If I'm going to be a, 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 a appropriate preacher, if I'm going to be a, a preacher, a preacher of righteousness, a preacher of God's word, a preacher the way that God wants me to preach, I can't be worried about making money 
I can't be thinking about, oh man, I need more people in, in, in the pews in order for me to, to make more money and to make my life more comfortable. And every, I can't be thinking about that at all. That cannot be a thought. That cannot enter into my head even once. Because that's when you start trimming the message, when you start preaching for money and you have that love of money and then you start censoring when you say, oh, well, someone's going to get offended at this. I can't preach that. I can't say this. But that's going to make people leave. It's not going to draw people in. Turn if you to Matthew 13. It's the last place I'll have you turn. Matthew 13. Matthew 13. We need to take heed to covetousness. And like I said, this is, this is the time of year, Christmas time. The, you know, the marketing goes through the roof. People are trying to sell you on everything. Trying to get you to open up credit and go into debt and participate in usury to, to, to just get all these things that you need. You don't even know how bad you need them until we tell you how much you need them. You don't know what you're missing. You know what? You're not missing out on anything. The things that you don't have right now, you don't need them. You just need to be content with what you have. You're getting by without it now. You're still here. And your life's going to be a lot happier if you're not thinking about the things you don't have right now. And being thankful for what God's given you. Matthew 13 is the parable, you know, in, within Matthew 13 is the parable of the sower. And again, I just want to just nail this down so we understand, you know, it's not, you're not immune from sin just because you're saved. That's why we're taking heed. That's why we're trying to be diligent to take heed to God's warnings about getting wrapped up into this stuff. Matthew 13, you all, well, we're not going to read the whole parable. We, we know the parable. This is the explanation for starting in verse 18. Hear, there, hear ye therefore the parable of the sower, when anyone heareth the word of the kingdom and understandeth it not, then cometh the wicked one, catcheth away that which was sown in his heart. This is he which received seed by the wayside. First guy is not even saved. Didn't understand it. Didn't understand the gospel. Satan comes away, snatches it away, so now it's not in their heart anymore. They don't understand, so they're not going to get saved until they hear it again. Someone else sows seed. Verse 20, But he that received the seed in the stony places, the same as he that heareth the word, and anon what joy receiveth it. They hear the word of God, the gospel. They get saved. They receive it. Yet hath he no root in himself, but doeth for a while, for when tribulation and persecution ariseth, because the word by and by he's offended. So, he gets offended pretty early on because people start harassing him. Oh, you believe the Bible, whatever, you know, and, and, and starts facing a little bit of tribulation. That offends him, and he drops out of actually living the way God wants you to live. Doesn't lose his salvation. He already received the seed. He received the word. He's saved. But he couldn't handle the heat. So he's just not going to do anything for God. And look at the next, the next example, verse 22. He also that received seed among the thorns is he that heareth the word. And the care of this world and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and he becometh unfruitful. Now, this one's interesting because it says that he becometh unfruitful. What does that mean? He was fruitful before. He got saved. He started becoming fruitful. He became a soul winner, started living for God. And then what happened? The care of this world. Things started being introduced into his life. The deceitfulness of riches, the thought of, oh man, I just need to make some more money. Oh, I need to spend all my time doing this. Takes you away from serving God. You become unfruitful. The more, and, and beware of this too, because you know what? God may bless you. God may bless you financially. There, there have been men in the Bible that have been blessed financially. It happens. And no, I'm not a prosperity preacher. I'm not saying, well, if you're living righteousness and you're going to get all these blessings on this earth and you're just going to have all this money and stuff, that's nonsense. The Bible, God doesn't promise you that here. He promises you riches in heaven for working for him. But God may or may not bless you with finances. Who cares? I know both how to be abased and I know how to abound. Right? Whether God gives me very little and we have to just, just scrape by, or God gives me a lot. Great. Either way, in both states, we need to maintain the right focus. The more stuff, the more abundance that you have, the easier it is to become wrapped up in that stuff. 
It takes more and more and more of your time. It takes more of your energy. Beware. Take heed, soul winner, because this can make you become unfruitful. I mean, think about, think about, think about this. Okay. Someone goes from not having a car to getting a car. You think, great, right? I mean, it's allow you get, get a lot, get transportation. It may save you some time because you're not taking public transportation, whatever, right? There's a lot of good benefits to that. But then, well, now you have this, this vehicle. Guess what? You got to pay registration. You got to fill the gas tank. You got to pay insurance. Oh, something broke on the car. Well, now you got to take a day off or now you got to get a fix or now you got to pay somebody. Oh, so it's even more money. Do you see how, I mean, that's one example. And I'm not saying you're wicked if you own a car. I own cars. Okay, I'm not saying that you're just wicked, but, but this is what we need to be, you know, that's just one example. Oh, I want to have a boat. We'll have fun. It's like, okay, now you got to need a place to store the boat. Now you need to pay more tag title, registration, insurance, you know, all the stuff on that. Now you're going to have to maintain that boat. Now you're going to, you know, now you're going to need a place to store it. Well, I need to build a barn or keep it in. I need, you know, you follow along that path. It eats up all of your time. Well, I need to do this and I need to do that and I need to do this and I need to do that. And I have this big property. Well, now I need to do this and I need to take care of that. And I need to, you know, well, where's your time for soul winning? Well, I don't, I, I can't, I don't have time. I have too many things I need to take care of. Why? Because you care too much about your stuff. That is the trap. And that, that can be covetous. Things you already have is just consuming you. Because, why? Because you're serving that money and those things and maintaining that stuff instead of seeking first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. It's a heart problem. Where is your priority? Is God first or is he last? That, I mean, even if you're not covetous right now, if God is last in your life, and you do happen to have time for him, you happen to have time for church, you happen to have time to, to go soul winning, that's going to stop really soon if God's last. Because your life will just become full of other things because God's last. You're going to think of all this other stuff, and before you know it, church is out, Bible reading's out, praying's out, soul winning's out. Don't have time for it. That's why God needs to be first. So you say, I don't care What's going on? I don't care how much money I have or don't have. I'm going to make sure that no matter what, I'm serving the Lord. Why? Because he'll take care of me. And if problems come up and things arise, I'm not going to worry about them. We'll take care of them. As I mentioned this morning, it may not be fun to deal with. But have the faith that God does take care of you, and God, and this is what He told us, told us, told us to do. This is what He wants us to do. Serve Him. Have the faith. Look at the finish line. Look at the treasures in heaven. Let let our heart be where our treasure. If we're accumulating treasures, you say, man, this is great. You could get on that roll and be like, man, we're soul winning. We're doing all this stuff. Let's keep moving in that direction, not away from it. Let's add more to that because, why? You're, it's going to build on, it's going to snowball, right? Your heart's now going to be more, hey, I built up this, let's keep building it, right? I mean, it's the same way people do with physical finances, with money, right? You start making a lot of money, and then people want to just make more and more and more. You get a taste of that, oh man, this is cool, now I could do this, and now I could buy that, and now I could, you know, and you just want more. Because now all the things that you had wanted previously that you just, man, if I could just have this, things would be great. You got it, and it's not that big of a deal. So you're looking ahead, saying, okay, well, yeah, this was good, but I still, I still don't feel like we're doing that well. I just need to make a little bit more. Okay, I just need to spend a little bit more time. And that's how it goes. Beware of covetousness. Take heed. Take heed lest you fall. This, happen, this, this happens to anybody. And you know what? Satan's going to want you to be tempted, especially if you're serving God right now. He wants you out. He wants you out of the fight, out of the race. He wants you to be choked with the cares of this world so you can become unfruitful. As far as I have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your warnings in the Bible. God, I, I pray that you would help us all to have more faith, 
to, we read your words, we hear your words, we look at them, and I know we believe them, dear Lord, but help us to have just the, the, the full confidence and faith to be able to trust, just as much as we trust your words for our souls to go to heaven, that we are fully trusting in you. Lord, help us to have that type of faith to, to, in every other aspect and everything else that you said, especially when it comes to, to us being taken care of and provided for, Lord, and help us to sever these, these wicked fleshly desires and appetites to just want to have more riches in this world. That's not right. And we can see that. And we have this wicked flesh. Lord, help us to mortify the deeds of our flesh. Help us to, to just sever that and to be walking in the Spirit and to be spiritually minded and to be focused on, on serving you, serving others, and doing what's right and, and getting our hearts and our minds focused on the treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, dear Lord. In Jesus Christ's blessed name we pray, amen.